All right, so let's take a few notes today. Let's uh, continue with political parties. And this is approximately where we left off yesterday, and I think we can move on past this today. I do think, and I put in here, I'm skipping the history of political parties. And it's not a long, a ton of pages in the book, but I'm not even going to really go to the rise and decline of political parties. But I do think that's relevant, that you probably need to look through that. I mean, I think you should read the whole chapter. But I'm not going to give any notes on those. We're just going to move on to stuff. I'm not sure we'll get through everything that I want to get through up by the time what we want to test anyway, uh, depending on you know what we do. I have another activity I like to do with election stuff, but I don't know. You know, sometimes we get to some of those things, and sometimes we don't. Um, questions on anything before we move past? All right. So let's look at, when we say the term split ticket, what do we mean by split ticket? Or even the term divided government, what do we mean by that? You may vote differently. You may vote for a Republican president, Democratic senator, you know, or something like that. That's what we mean by split ticket. And that's why we, sometimes we get a divided government. Even within the same state, we're a Republican state. I showed you those numbers yesterday. And if you look at, um, for much of our times, we voted for, we always vote for Republican governors, we always vote for Republican presidents. However, it's not uncommon for us to have, you know, we have two senators and one representative, to have two Democrats and one uh, Republican representing us in Washington, D.C., or two Republicans and one but Democrat. But, but it's not common for us to have, like we have right now, all three Republicans. Okay, when Rounds won the election this year, and the House, he's a Republican. Uh, no, Rounds, my, excuse me, is a senator. He won the spot that was, uh, that was held by uh, Johnson, who just retired, who had been a Democrat. Uh, Thune is a Republican. Thune beat Daschle out when he ran, and Daschle had been a longtime uh, Democratic candidate. Uh, and then when Christy Nome won a few years ago, she won over Stephanie Herseth Sadlin, who was a Democrat. And Sadlin had held that position for, I think, two terms, maybe three, uh, for, so either four or six years. So, it, you know, even though we are a Republican state, it's not uncommon for us to have Democratic senators or representatives, uh, and that would be split tickets. Obviously, some people are voting Republican for president, Republican for governor, but Democrat for some of these other positions because you're voting on them on the same ballot. Okay, so when we talk about a split ticket, it means that we don't always follow just party lines when it comes to voting. Um, you know, kind of like examples I gave. Uh, and when the ballot is... When we vote for president, we're also voting for members of Congress, always members of the House, or our single one here, uh, typically a senator, you know, not every election because senators serve for six years, so sometimes they're not up there, but always uh, typically governors, uh, members of the state representatives, you know, and peer and, and those things. So we have a lot of things to vote for on a, on a ballot. We may not just follow, you know, I'm not going to just vote along party lines. Many of us will vote on party lines quite a bit, though. Um, so what it does create, though, then, is, is what we call divided government. And I don't know if divided government is a good thing or a bad thing, but it is not uncommon. Uh, you know, President Obama had a Democratic House and Senate for a little bit. President Bush had a, Demo or a Republican House and Senate for a little bit. But neither were able to kept them, keep them through all of the presidency. Uh, so what do you think? Is a divided government, and divided government is just, let's say a president is, or we'll put it right now, a Democrat, uh, and the House representatives right now are Republican, and the Senate is Republican. Is that preferable that, than all three being of the same party? And I know we haven't studied bill the law, but for any legislation to be made, it has to be made in Congress. Any budget to be passed, it has to go through Congress. Okay, so it takes a majority vote, it's a little harder in the Senate, because uh, of filibusters, but nonetheless, a majority vote. And then it has to be signed by the president. The president can veto it. Congress can override a veto, but it takes a two-thirds vote to override a veto, which is very, very rare. In the history of the United States, 4% of vetoes have been overridden. 96% of vetoes stand. So president veto power is pretty powerful. So 
So are we better off with a divided government of any kind of thing, being this Democrat and Republican or whatever, or would we be better off if all three were in the same party? What do you think? All there. Why aren't they going to get as much done? This probably goes without saying, but explain why. Why don't you think they'll get as much done? Certainly, it's. I mean, it, it, you know, kind of an obvious thing. It's just harder to get things accomplished. And if we make it different, like what it used to be before that last election, is Democrat. Republican, it's even hard to get anything through Congress itself, let alone getting to the present president. So certainly, less things will get accomplished. Why could it be a good thing then? Why is divided government not necessarily a bad idea? Okay. So it's not just a small percentage or a portion of society getting what they want. Maybe <laughs> nobody's getting it. If I can't have it, neither can you kind of thing. Yeah. Theoretically, to get anything done, there has to be a compromise, doesn't there? You know, it seems like maybe nobody's happy, but nobody's mad either, in a sense. We both get a little bit of something. Nobody gets exactly what they want. That's, you know, theoretically, it forces Congress uh, or the president to compromise. They have to work together to get anything they want. You know, so divided government in itself is probably, probably best for the citizens as a whole. It's probably better for all of us, you know. Um, and it's very common. We have divided governments much of the time. And then I know we haven't studied the Senate yet, but in order to pass a bill through the Senate, because the Senate can filibuster, you really need a two-thirds vote to get anything, or you need a 60 vote to get anything done, because you can filibuster, which is basically denying a vote. We'll cover filibusters later, but for the simple version, it's just preventing a vote to happen. And if a vote doesn't happen, a bill can't pass. You know, you can't, can't move to the next stage without a, without a vote. And if you can deny a vote, you can stop a bill. So in, to end the filibuster, it's called the cloture rule, you need 60 senators to end the filibuster. So if you have, you know, a, a 51 to 49 advantage, well, you got the majority advantage. Um, but if anybody on that 49 decide to filibuster the bill, you don't have the number to end the filibuster, so that bill's not going anywhere. The reality of the Senate is you need 60 votes to get anything done. So a party to have a filibuster-proof Senate really needs to have 60. And President Obama had a filibuster-proof Senate for a very short time when he first was president until Ted Kennedy died. Ted Kennedy was a, was a, a, was a Democrat from Massachusetts. He died, uh, and then they held a special election, and a Republican was elected to fill that spot. But for at least a year, the Democrats had... Uh, a filibuster-proof Senate, which frustrates me with the Democratic Party because I think they should have jammed through the things that they wanted at that point, but they didn't. Why not? Uh, no clue. Uh, no clue. Incompetent. The Republicans can, no, they don't have a filibuster-proof, so the Democrats can filibuster anything in the Senate. Uh, so the chances of much getting accomplished right now in, in President Obama's last two years we haven't got much accomplished in the, in the two years previously. Uh, but, but I don't think it's President Obama's fault any more than it is Congress's fault, or really just the nature of the beast here. And maybe, again, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's the good thing. You know, when we look at the size of government, and I know I went back to that same slide, but if we look at the size of government, we think of, you know, how big should government be? How encompassing in our life? You know, and, and remember, our founders felt that the federal government should be pretty small. You know, if you look at the Republican Party, and especially the Tea Party is now, they're, they're really in favor of smaller government, less regulation. And there's a, a senator from North Carolina, I believe, yesterday, uh, or this week, made a statement about washing hands. 
Um, and he, he was talking about Starbucks and about should there be laws and regulations about washing your hands after you use the restroom. And he said, no, there should not be. And the first thing, well, wow, this guy wants us to go in there and, and, you know, do we want workers who are working in restaurants to not wash your hands? But what he said was, the market will take care of it. If, you know, they put up a sign and says, hey, we don't require our workers to wash their hands after they use the restroom, then most likely people will say, you know what, I think I'll go get my food somewhere else. And he said the market will take care of it. We don't need a government regulation saying that you have to wash hands. The market itself will take care of it, but people won't eat at that restaurant unless they require people to wash their hands. However, requiring that restaurant to put up a sign that says that we don't wash hands, is that any different than requiring them to wash their hands? It's still government regulation, isn't it? So, you know, but, but smaller government is saying we want less rules. Maybe we don't need all the rules we have. Maybe, the, you know, society itself will take care of some of those problems. Uh, when we get to national party structure here, um, the National Party, the State Party, even the local, the, the Minnehaha County Democrats, Minnehaha County Republicans, are not really dictated, or their actions are not dictated by what they do at the national level. There is a National Republican Party and a National Democratic Party, uh, but they really can't make the other parties do, the, the lower levels do anything. We like to say that, that, that political parties are grassroots organizations. When we think of grassroots organizations, anytime you use that term, we mean bottom-up organization. That it's not some power at the top that's dictating down and everyone's following the rules like a lot of businesses or, or organizations or military or whatever. We think of, uh, of political parties being like grassroots, where it starts at the bottom and they really make most of the decisions for themselves. Uh, now there is, again, there's a national party organization that they do some things, but they have very little control over those at the bottom. Um, and that's what that basically refers. So, you know, who did, who did the, the Democrats of the state pick to run for office? Well, the Democrats of South Dakota picked, you know, who they were going to run for office, uh, you know, against the governor, you know, for that Senate spot, for a House spot. It's not a national party saying, all right, here's who, here's the best people you got in South Dakota, this is the person you're interested in. You know, and really the primaries make the decision as much as anything else. Um, they have some control over a few things. There is a convention every four years. The parties choose when the convention will be. And the convention um, is done for presidential elections, not for, not for congressional elections. But they set the time when that convention is going to be. It's always going to be late in the summer, either late July, early August. Sometimes it sneaks into September. Uh, it's usually a four to five day event. And it's during a presidential election year. So the next one we're going to have is going to be in 2016. And both the Democrats and Republicans will have a convention. Conventions used to be really important because the conventions used to be when the parties chose their candidate. If we're holding a convention and it's in August uh, of the election year, you wouldn't know who the candidate is. You might have three or four people that want to be that candidate. But at the convention itself, that issue was settled. I think it changed in 72 is when we started to go to the primaries. And when we started to go to the primary system, it really took a lot of the importance out of those, those conventions. But there still is a convention. They still write their platform at the convention, which is what the party stands for. And every four years, they rewrite those platforms. Um, when the primaries are held, you know, somewhat the state has some say, but the party will say, you know, here's when your primary is held. Uh, Florida wanted to bump their primaries up. Primaries are held during the presidential election year. For, for If it's a congressional primary, it's just one in the state. But presidential primaries are going to have one each state, but those states, it's going to be divided up over, it used to be February to June. Now they move it up to the very beginning of January to June. And some states have caucuses and some have primaries. Florida wanted to move theirs up to make it more important. And, and I think it was the Republicans, it might have been the Democrats, said, no, we don't want you to. And if they did, they were going to take away their delegates. So you can hold your primary, but it's going to mean nothing. Um, so they couldn't tell them they couldn't move it up, but they could. They had some influence on it because if, it, it wouldn't mean anything if they did. Uh, so they have some say over that. When we look at you know political parties, and we see that there are some similarities, especially with the two major ones. 
Okay, the fact that they hold a convention every four years, uh, which we briefly talked about, that they have a national committee. Um, both uh, there's a there's both a Republican and Democrat national committee. Uh, they have a campaign committee, and the campaign committee helps people run for office. Uh, give them advice, give them speaking points. Sometimes uh, help them with, with you know, what do you need to do to campaign? You know, both have that because again, remember the goal of a political party is not just to be a group of people who share similar ideas. The goal of a political party is to get your members elected, so then you can make policy that reflect what your ideals are. You know, so that's kind of the the, the key thing. Uh, both have a national chairperson. Um, that manages the day to day. They speak for the party at times. Well, typically, the president is the speaker of their party, but actually, that's not. They're not the chairperson of the party. Uh, but they each have these. None of these are exceptionally powerful. The convention doesn't choose the candidate, but it does still write the platform. However, when we say it writes a platform, a platform is what a party believes in. You want to find out what the Democrats believe? Read their platform. You know, it's probably thirty pages long. It's actually, I think it's closer to 60. And it'll be on every issue imaginable. And the Republicans will have the same thing on the economy, on crime, on wars, on fighting terrorism, on you know, the, the environment, uh, energy, everything, budget, all that stuff is there. So you can get a comparison. This is what they stand for. The parties write a platform every four years. The candidates don't have to follow that platform, meaning that if I'm a presidential candidate, and we have, let's say I'm a Democratic uh, candidate, and they have the Democratic platform, my beliefs may vary from that. I may deviate from it. Now, for the most part, you're not going to. But let's use an example of, let's say the Republican platform says that you're opposed to same-sex marriage. I don't, I don't know if that's still on the, the Republican platform, but it was. I think it is. But let's say I'm a Republican running for office, and I'm in favor of same-sex marriage. I can deviate from that. The party can't dictate that I have to support everything that's on their platform. You know, uh, it's hard to get a nomination if you don't agree with what the, the party believes, but nonetheless, they can deviate and do at times. Well, they have delegates that go there, uh, and that's a good question of who exactly. I know who the delegates are who actually, you know, will vote for the candidates, but those are different than who writes the platform. I don't have to look up who. What? Who actually writes the platform? I don't know for sure. They have a, 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 a platform committee, and they have different people that bring ideas on their vote on it, but I don't know who gets the final say. Other question? Preferably one I can answer. All right. um, now, the other thing that the parties do, and I mentioned this briefly yesterday, is they have a list of all their members. They have that on a database. They have the, their addresses. They have their email addresses. They have all, so, it, so they will, will, will send out things. They will ask for money. Uh, I told you this yesterday. I get at least once a week asking for money. I get two or three a day. And it's just straight to delete, to delete, to delete, to delete, to delete. Biden is like we're buddy. I get something from Biden all the time. Um, obviously, he's not personally making it to me, but it's, you know, and... and and um, the head of the, the Democratic Party. I mean, and lots of times they're asking for money. Um, and usually it's, hey, fight the Republicans because they're doing this. And I, my wife is a, is a Republican. So our votes never even matter, truthfully. We cancel each other out. So we could both stay home and never vote, and it wouldn't make any difference at, at all, uh, except for I'm more politically active than she is. So sometimes she does it, like, she works longer hours than me. Uh, and if it, her voting is on an election day, I mean, if she's working, she probably won't do an absentee ballot. Uh, on those days, I don't necessarily say, hey, you know what, you should get that absentee ballot. Because I know those days that my vote might actually matter. We're not going to just cancel each other out. Now, we don't always, well, actually, we don't talk politics very much because it just leads to arguments. Uh, I'm not making that up. So peaceful coexistence in our house means that I'm not, it's not mean that we never talk politics, but we don't argue politics. Um, what's that? Too long. I guarantee. I guarantee my wife will not listen to a government lecture. 
I, I have no fear at all of that ever happening. Um, uh, sometimes the, the party itself will give money to candidates, and actually that's not uncommon. They don't always. If they feel a candidate has enough money, or if they don't necessarily like that candidate, they don't give them money. And that they, you do see that occasionally. The candidate is, is not really towing the party line, or doesn't, they have some views that go against maybe something. Maybe I'm a, a Republican, but I like Obamacare. Um, you know, uh, there were three Republicans in the House vote the other day because they voted to repeal Obamacare again. Uh, and there's three Republicans that, that didn't go along with the party. And I don't know. There's probably a reason behind it. I'm sure there are. You know, they may, it may be good for their, their district itself. But either way, they went against party lines. That doesn't mean in the next election that the party will say, uh-oh, we're not giving you any money. But it doesn't mean it won't either. You know, it could be if you are always going against or, or regularly going against party lines, they may say, you know what, we're not going to help you out. Um, now you may say, well, that doesn't make any sense because... If they lose, they're going to be a Democrat in there. But when it comes to the primary, they may not. If I'm a, a running, if I'm in office already, and I'm running for re-election, I still got to win a primary again. I may not get that nomination again for for my, you know, for my party to run for re-election. Um, you know, and if that's the case, then you know they they may, if they don't like you or they don't like what you're doing, they may try to help your opponent in the primaries get elected. I don't know. It's possible. I, I, I don't know. Um, this was according to your book. I don't know if I could confirm this or not. A lot of the Republican National Committee, RNC and DNC. RNC is Republican National Committee. Uh, DNC is Democratic National Committee. Those who recruit and train Republican candidates. Um, in, in the recruitment, Portion. Who would be good? You know, who do we think would be good members of Congress? You know, um, <coughs> and I think, you know, when it comes around, I, I imagine the Republicans recruited him. I mean, he used to be governor. You got an open seat, you know, in a Republican state. Who has the best chance of winning? Well, somebody with name recognition that seems like would be good, right? Um, and who has better recognition than someone who's a two-term governor of your state? I mean, so, so it makes sense that you would choose, that you would recruit him. Now, maybe they didn't have to recruit him. Maybe Rounds just wanted to. But that seems like somebody that if he wasn't originally planning on running, that, that he would be recruiting. He had been recruited? Yeah. It was, it, I mean, you, really, you want somebody to win, right? You, and you want the best person out there running. Uh, or the best person who has a chance of, uh, of winning running. And name recognition matters, but not just name recognition. Uh, name recognition and no baggage helps. Name recognition and intelligence, I think, would be a good thing. Uh, but that's not necessary to run for office. I mean, nobody who runs for office is going to be an idiot. We're not going to. There's probably a few. But the truth of the matter is, is we're not going to elect people that, that, that are just completely unintelligent. So being the smartest person doesn't make you the best candidate. Being the smartest person doesn't make you the best at anything, does it? Now, maybe that's coming from somebody who's probably never been the smartest person in the room ever. And you might be the smartest person in the room lots of times. I don't know, you're AP students. But that doesn't mean that you are better at something than somebody else or will do a better job. You know, the grades are an indicator of what kind of student you are. But they're not an indicator if you'll be good at what you do. You know, there's other aspects. You've got to be able to get along with people. You've got to be able to communicate. You know, you've got to be able to, you know, there's other things, no matter what your job is, that you have to be able to do. When you guys get out to college, um, you're going to realize you're going to have some very, very intelligent professors that have absolutely no clue how to teach. So just because they're intelligent does not mean that they're a good teacher. You know what I mean? Uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And that goes true with a lot of different things. It doesn't mean you won't be either, but it's not that in itself. Uh, maybe it's just us guys that have never been the smartest like to say those kind of things. But I think I'm correct. Um, early 70s, I think it was 72, 
is when we started to use the, the primary system rather than just the straight convention of nominating candidates for president of the United States, presidential party. Okay, and we kind of mentioned this, and you'll get a little history of that when you're, when, when you're reading um, your chapters there. But it's taken some power away from the parties themselves. They don't have, it's no longer a mystery when the convention rolls around on who's going to be the, the candidate for the party. The primaries have chosen that. Now, really how this works, and we need to talk about this because this is something that it, there's, there's a realistic way how it happens, and then there's, there's something that we need to know, is that, that each party will set a certain amount of delegates on how many you need to be the candidate to, to win the nomination. And there's not a number because both parties do it differently, and it's not written into the Constitution, so I don't know the numbers on the top of my head. We can look them up. One of them is like 20-some hundred, and the other one is like 1,500 or something. Um, and when you win a state, you get those, those delegates. So, and there's a difference, and we'll get into this later when we talk about uh, caucuses and primaries. So I'll just keep it simple today. We'll just say they're all primaries. We won't even talk about what a caucus is. But let's say that we have the, the New Hampshire primary, and we have four candidates here, okay? And one candidate gets 40% of the vote, and the other one gets 30%, another one 20, and another one 10. They will get delegates then. The winner doesn't get, it's not winner take all, at least in most states. Okay, so the winner will get, I don't know how many, I'm just making up numbers. I have no clue what the actual number is for each state, because it really never <coughs> becomes all that important. But let's say the winner in this case gets, I don't know, 30 delegates, uh, and this one gets... 15 and 5, and then after two, after three, you get zero. Okay, so by winning that state, you haven't won anything, but you won some delegates. And those delegates, let's say you guys are the delegates here, then when the convention goes, you're supposed to cast your vote for that candidate. Okay, and sometimes you're bound by the party. Like if 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 you're a delegate here uh, and you're bound to give it to candidate A, then when that convention rolls around, then you're bound to cast that vote for A. Sometimes they're not bound. Okay, so then we have another primary, and candidate A wins, and B comes in third, and C, and so on. Uh, and then they win more delegates, right? And there's this magic number that they're trying to reach. Right, and somebody will get it. However, it never comes to that. Because what happens is, is after a few primaries, candidate D decides, well, this is not my year. And a few primaries later, candidate B drops out. And, you know, it doesn't have to be A. Who's, who's, maybe they're not winning them all. Okay, eventually, candidate A drops out. We might still have 10 or 15 primaries left to go, and there's no candidates left. We know at that point that that candidate, whoever is left, is going to get the nomination. Okay, it's a foregone conclusion. So it's already almost they've been anointed uh, with that, and it may be in March, but the last primary is not done until, uh, the last primary is, or caucus is not done until June. There's a reality that we should know, especially for this class. You need to know that there are delegates that are, that are each party allots to each stage based on population and so on. I mean, I think that is something to know. But realistically, if you're just a citizen in society here, it never comes to that. It never comes down to the total amount of delegates. And then there becomes some question is, okay, candidate A won a few states. Okay, these candidates here that were sworn to candidate A, but now candidate A is out of the picture, who can they cast their vote for? And there becomes some question, do they cast the vote for the next person? Does that candidate themselves have the right to say, hey, I'm going to give my support to this candidate, and then are those delegates sworn to that? We never, I don't know. I don't know because it never comes to it. It's just always, hey, Romney, everybody's dropped out. Romney's the only one left. He's going. The closest we've come is with Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton uh, went down to in the May before Hillary Clinton dropped out. So there's a reality, and then there's a you know realistically you know what what it says, or maybe those aren't the right words, but no, no. There is not a certain order that has to be. The states set their own time for the most part. However, New Hampshire by law says that they have to be the first primary. So if anybody moves their primary in front of New Hampshire, New Hampshire will move it in front of theirs. If anybody else, I mean, so they, they want to be number one. Iowa is the first caucus. 
Now, and this is kind of, as you watch stuff in the news today, this comes out, Iowa's a caucus. New Hampshire and Iowa are not important states. They're not big when it comes to electoral votes. Iowa's got, what, six? New Hampshire, I can't see New Hampshire, but I think they got three, maybe four, four. They're not really important. But in the primary season, they're huge because you want to win some of those first states. And if you win some of those first states, then you can build on that momentum and keep going, right? So where are candidates hanging out today? They're in Iowa all the time. Chris Christie's been to Iowa a bunch lately. Walker's been to Iowa. Why are they hanging out in Iowa? Because that's the first caucus. And they hang out in New Hampshire, too. And they're looking to win that primary, those primaries and caucuses already. So the party determines how many delegates a state has. They determine how many total delegates is, are needed to win the nomination. Um, again, it's something I already mentioned. Right? Democrats have something known as superdelegates. Now, they could change this because, again, this is not in the Constitution or anything. Parties don't even mention the Constitution. So this is all party rule stuff. They have what they call superdelegates. And superdelegates are elected officials. So if you're, let's say, a Democratic governor of a state, you are a superdelegate, which means that you get to cast your vote. You're not bound by any vote in the state. You just get to cast votes. And I think you get, I don't know if your vote is worth five of a regular delegate. I'm not exactly sure. When you read that chapter, it'll say. Um, the, de the Republicans don't use the superdelegate thing. Uh, but the Democrats do. So if I'm a governor, and I'm a Democratic governor, I'm a Democratic senator, whatever, I'm a superdelegate, and I can cast my vote for whoever I want to make any difference who my state had voted for. Okay, they, and they have some say. And these things might be really, really important if it ever came down to the delegates' matter. So the only time this matters is early on. Political junkies like myself, we'll be watching this stuff, and say, ah, oh, he's got so many delegates. But in reality, after everyone's dropped out, is it becomes completely unimportant. unimportant. I've never seen a, a super delegate vote matter, you know. Uh, but nonetheless, it'd be cool if I had a super title. I'm a super teacher. In my class, they're worth twice as much as everybody else. That would be awesome. However, they don't let me have. Them. Okay. Uh, so there, there are some differences when it comes to that. And again, at least for knowledge of how the system works, I think that's important. I mean, if you really understand primary work, you've got to have more than the cursory is you win. You shouldn't think it's winner take all. And you shouldn't think that, that there's no delegates and stuff. Uh, but I think as, a, as a, a person in society, I don't know if you really need to have. I, I think if it comes down to a really close race, there's going to be enough stuff in the media that you're going to learn it at that point. As an AP student, AP probably thinks you need to know. So you, so you probably do. I don't think. Do I teach delegates or superdelegates in my regular government class? We mention it. Have you ever heard of this before? I don't. I mean, I don't. I doubt if I do because I don't know if, if, it's, if it's terribly important. All right. Enough. Good enough for today. About forty-nine, right? Forty-five. Yeah. We're about it. Hey, I gave you two assignments again. You don't have to work on them over the weekend, but I'd read something over the weekend. If you want, we have a minute or two left. We have some students that are not here that I could give you the mic and you could sing a song. Emily, you're pretty loud. Would you like to talk? Oh, thanks. <laughs> Anybody want to sing a song? Here's your chance. Tristan? Haley? Allison? No singers in here? <laughs> the others? They're all gone. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. The people who might do this are not here. Yeah. I bet they would like it. <laughs> <laughs>